um, joining us this afternoon and you know, taking time uh, to hear about this issue. It truly is a tragedy um, that we've lost several uh, sailors, three sailors in a very short period of time recently and, um, you know, up to seven uh, before that. So, you know, when these kind of things happen, um, I think it's very important uh, to take a, a deep look um, and also a broad look uh, into the contributing factors uh, behind these types of incidents. And being somebody who served myself in the Navy for 20 years on six ships, on two carriers, you know, you understand that within the crew of a ship, um, you know, every member of the ship is, is a like a family member. Um, so it's, um, you know, it, it's hit the crew hard. Um, and my walk around the ship, I had the opportunity to speak to multiple sailors and really kind of just wandering around, um, talking to sailors in the reactor department, the supply department, on the mess decks, in the medical department. Um, and, you know, heard from sailors who, you know, knew these other sailors personally and really, you know, feel the loss and the impact of that loss. Um, also had the opportunity to talk to the command triad, so the, the commanding officer, the XO, and the command master chief, as well as um, some senior Navy leadership um, from across the region um, and hear their thoughts, um, the in status of ongoing investigation. I think most of you on this call um, also had to, an opportunity to get an update today um, from the Navy on that. So we'll probably defer any specific questions about the investigation to the Navy, but I would say that um, you know, I think that the investigations that they're undertaking are appropriate because I said they're they're both deep, essentially within the CVN seventy three as a command um, into command climate, living conditions, you know, all different types of contributing factors uh, within that particular ship, but also more broad um, to include other ships um, in lengthy availabilities like the CVN seventy three. Um, there was also a string of incidents on the CVN seventy seven. Um, the, the Bush uh, a few years ago after they did a lengthy overhaul at Norfolk Naval Shipyard. I think they were 27 months in that availability. Um, and so really being able to look across multiple commands to understand the trends. Um, you know, some things I took away uh, from the visit um, when talking with the commanding officer, the command master chief, um, I would say that, you know, this also hits them very personally, and they feel a great responsibility to make sure that they're taking care of the crew and taking all actions possible. They've applied a huge amount of pressure to help, you know, get some of the sailors um, into a different environment, a different living environment. Um, those sailors, you know, who need to be on the ship because they're standing watch, because they're on duty, because of fire uh, watches and security details, you know, they um, do uh, have to be there um, uh, at all hours. Um, but that is obviously in duty sections and rotating. Um, but they've been able to identify um, accommodations off the ship for sailors who so desire, and they're they're moving sailors um, now. I think there's a lot of stress on the crew because the availability has run long and been extended again. Um, one of the common things I heard from the junior sailors across the ship is, you know, this is their first duty station. So they went to boot camp and got basic training, some additional specialty training depending on their rating, so their job. And then came to the ship, but this is all they've known uh, of the Navy. And through our discussion, that was one of the things that, you know, was talk talked about a lot. Uh, what is the right manning of a ship in an extended availability like this? Um, is it the right place? And how long should tours be for junior sailors? Um, are sailors being assigned, you know, for too long outside of uh, the training that they received coming into the Navy? And it was a common theme as well among sailors I talked to as I walked around the ship. You know, I asked them, how long have you been here? Is this your first duty station? Um, and, you know, some sailors had had the opportunity to cross deck, so actually go underway on other ships to receive training to, you know, and been familiarized with what it's like to be underway on a ship. I think that did help them develop sort of a vision of, of what uh, they were going to look forward to um, when they came out of the shipyard, as well as provide them you know, much needed training to be a ready crew when they do come out of the yards. Um, you know, I, I would say that I think that the, the captain, the command master chief, the command triad, um, I would say they have their heads and their hearts in the right place. They're really doing everything they can with the resources available um, through the Navy um, to help move sailors off the ship, to help get additional resources for mental health care. Um, and I walked around and, you know, had a tour of the um, birthing spaces, the mess decks, um, and saw the, um, you know, current condition there, which, um, you know, for an industrial environment, um, you know, it 
I would say that the birthings, you know, some of them looked um, exactly as they would for a ship underway. Others had minimal um, extra services running through the, the birthings, but the ship did meet the milestones quite a few months back. Um, I'm just looking at the date that I wrote down here, but um, it, to, to move aboard the ship. But, you know, when we are overstressing our maintenance capabilities, so we have CVN 73 at Newport New Shipbuilding, CVN 74 there as well, um, plus multiple other, you know, ships and availability, submarine crews, and we're really looking for accommodations for those sailors. A lot of sailors on the CVN 73 moved back on board when the CVN 74 um, started their refueling overhaul. So long story short, as you know, as a member of Congress, one of the main things I'm looking for is like, what are the other resources we need to uh, provide? Uh, what is some of the infrastructure that's necessary? So I had a lengthy conversation about some of the contributing factors to the delays in the shipyard maintenance, some of the issues that may sound as basic as parking. Um, but, you know, if you look at the friction uh, for sailors where it takes them a certain amount of time, if they're not living on board the ship to commute and then park and then get to the ship, um, you could be adding two, two and a half hours in some cases onto their work day and, you know, the additional stresses. Um, I think that, um, and then the, the, you know, the sort of the living conditions and what kind of facilities we have in the vicinity of the shipyard, you know, as far as having ships and refueling overhaul, RCOH, there is always a, a carrier, normally only one, but always a carrier and, and refueling overhaul. And if you look at the eight additional carriers that are either built or being built right now, um, and you know, even just five years for each of those for refueling overhaul as we move forward, that's at least the next 40 years and certainly beyond um, that we'll have you know, sailors who are asked to work in this kind of environment. So I asked the Navy for feedback on, you know, really what other kind of investments can we make? Can there be additional off the ship, um, you know, barracks, housing, lodging, PPV is what they, they call it for the public private venture but those are sort of single sailor housing facilities in the vicinity of our bases what can we invest in um, and how can we work with the shipyard with the city of Newport News as well um, to be able to help uh, provide some of those additional um, you know living condition related um, things to the sailors and I think that I'll wrap up here by just you know giving an analogy that the commanding officer gave through our discussion and you know I think that this is one of those things where we need to kind of look at each of the elements he really described it as kind of like filling up a cup and you just keep filling it up. You know, you add these things in there. You have the stress of being, you know, a new sailor in the Navy. This is the only thing you know. You have, you know, these difficult working and living conditions. And then, you know, on top of that, what are the other stressors that people um, have in their lives and really being able to look at removing those friction points um, for sailors. And, you know, I, I think that the Navy probably gave updates on a lot of the um, actions that they're taking for additional mental health resources for a naval health Health Research Center team to come on board for training um, for the crew, um, for you know, basically peer support training, um, and you know several other um, you know concrete actions that they're taking. And you know, in my conversations with the crew, um, I think that the crew that I that I talked to and encountered who've had the ability to to move off the ship recently, you know, I think that they feel like the command is listening and cares. Um, but, you know, it, unfortunately, in some situations that those things can be too much or too little too late. Um, and I think that we need to look at the situation that we have on the GW now, but also look at it for the long term for the ships that will be, you know, uh, 74 and then ships in the future that will be undergoing RCOHs at um, Newport News Shipbuilding. So I can pause there. I'm sure people have specific questions and um, we'll do my best to answer. In some cases, maybe, you know, we'll we'll refer you to the Navy if it's not something that we have that level of detail on right now. So, um, Chase, I will turn it over to you to call on folks. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, our first question, um, we will go to Paul Bibbo. Just one yeah. second. Yeah. Hi, Congresswoman. Uh, I wanted uh, you to talk specifically about um, about the some people in the sailors were talking to the master chief petty officer uh, last week, and they talked specifically about the isolation of um, the facility in Newport News. And I wonder if you uh, received any feedback on that and what can be done, mm -hmm. given the fact that this is this place is going to be used for this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of overhaul in the, in the, for the foreseeable future. Yes. Um, so I think when you said isolation, I was first, my first thing that came to mind is COVID, um, you know, because I think also not only is there the physical geographical isolation of the facility at Newport News, so there really isn't the ability to sort of walk off the ship, walk off of the shipyard um, and, and be somewhere that sailors, you know, can, you know, 
get something to eat or go shopping or kind of just things that you would anticipate that someone would do um, during their off-duty time, um, as well as the COVID isolation and really encouraging people not to congregate in groups. Um, what I would say is that that is something that you know had, did come up. It came up with regards to the difficulty of accessing Newport News Shipbuilding, the, you know, the fact that the parking is incredibly far from there, um, the safety of walking from the parking that's designated at night back to the ship uh, was mentioned to me by one sailor. Um, and these are all things that we've taken note of. And I know that the command um, has as well. And, you know, over the course of time, I mean, there are, I think, in excess of 25,000 civilian shipyard workers who work at Newport News. And then on top of that, you could add uh, roughly another 7,000 or, or so, um, you know, active duty, depending on how many ships and submarines are there at the yard. And parking has been one of these problems that is truly a friction point. Um, and then when you talk about the isolation of the place, making it so hard to get there, um, and in the 90s, they, the city of Newport News, the shipyard, and the Navy did collaborate to build a parking facility, but there is much more needed. Um, and so there are concrete you know, things that can be done. The, the command is also you know, making sure to do an operational um, pause. Um, and you know, I think really their focus on that, it's not to necessarily do a safety stand down where you have sailors sit around and listen to lectures but an opportunity to have them, you know, as groups within their departments, their work centers, you know, sort of after COVID come back and sort of build that camaraderie, take care or, or, or you know, make sure sailors are aware of resources like MWR, MOL, uh, Welfare and Recreation, um, and also to try to connect them with, um, you know, different groups, activities, things in the community, as well as both the sponsorship and mentorship program. So like when a new sailor arrives at the ship, making sure that they're assigned a sponsor, someone who's been there for a while, a little more senior to them, knows the area and can help them to connect um, to other you know, resources, things to do, not just essentially sitting in the birthing lounge, you know, um, watching TV or things like that in their off-duty hours. So it is a challenge based off the location, but I, I did get the impression that the, the ship was making a concerted effort to leverage the resources available to them to, to help sailors not feel that isolation as much, especially coming out of COVID. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next, we'll go to Constantin Torpin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for doing this, uh, Congresswoman. Um, Constantine Turopin with military.com. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, it sounds like in your conversations with the sailors and crew, this came up and it came up in, in, in my reporting as well, that, you know, this idea that, you know, it's kind of a well, fairly well-established and well-known fact that shipyards are problematic for ships. And so, you know, one of the things that sailors expressed frustration to me about is the fact that, you know, we we do these RCOHs uh, on a regular basis and problems regularly come up. And it seems like it, certainly in this situation, but in most situations, the Navy doesn't act until something dramatic happens. In this case, multiple deaths. Um, you know, do you think that the Navy, in, certainly in hindsight, do you think the Navy could have been more 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 proactive in this situation? Um, so it's interesting because I ask a very similar question of Admiral Cottle, who's the commander of U.S. Fleet Forces Command. You know, I said, why does it take such a tragic string of events for the Navy to, you know, really stop and, and look uh, at all of the things that could have been contributing factors and change their practices and sort of, you know, elevate the importance of things that they may have, you know, put on the, the, the back burner or really, you know, not made priorities. Um, and so I do think that, you know, the, the Navy realizes, and I'm kind of, you know, giving you a paraphrase of a response that Admiral Cottle gave me, um, that they said, you know, that, that that seems in many circumstances such as this or the Bonham Richard was, was mentioned as well, um, that, you know, although they feel like they're very good at once there is a problem identified, finding solutions and corrective actions and following through on those um, that they are not always as proactive um, in certain circumstances and identifying problems before um, an incident of some type happens. Um, and, you know, that probably also could be you know, cited when you look at the collisions on McCain and Fitzgerald and other events over time. Um, you know, what are those sort of error chain things or contributing factors that are building up? Um, like how can they get better? And this is sort of a rhetorical question that was sort of asked by the Navy at the meeting we had. You know, how can they get better at identifying things, you know, before an event or a series of events? 
Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Chris Horn. Uh, Congresswoman, um, thanks for having this. And also, I just wanted to know, when you were in command of your own vessel, what were the red flags that you saw or watched out for when it came to maybe being proactive uh, and spotting mental health crises among your crew? Yeah, so I had command of Assault Craft Unit 2, so it was amphibious landing crafts. We were a shore-based command with a sea-based component that deployed on our amphibious ships in support of amphibious operations um, you know, from the East Coast, but worldwide. Um, you know, I think the thing I relied on um, a lot um, is walking around and, and talking to people and kind of getting that that feel. Like if you see sailors and you see them over and over again um, at the command and making sure that like not only yourself, but your executive officer, your command master chief um, can, can have that pulse in the sense where you can see that there's a change. And then also understanding, you know, people have certain reactions to things that are about to happen. Like if they're working up to a deployment or even, you know, when people come home from deployment, you know, on a ship, it's very frequent occurrence that you have sort of a pre-deployment sort of homecoming um, sessions, essentially to sort of prepare people for the fact, you know, you've been gone for a long time. You're coming back um, to your family who, although you've been deployed um, and very busy, they've had to kind of your spouse, for example, had to take care of everything on their own while you were gone. And how do you kind of manage those relationship uh, type things um, when sort of reintegrating into your normal life uh, at home. You know, having served at bigger commands that have, for example, a chaplain. So, so when I've served on an aircraft carrier, you know, I and, and, and even when I was in command, there was a chaplain for the beach group. So the command above mine and that chaplain served, you know, all of the commands across the waterfront. You know, although the chaplain always operates in complete confidentiality with individual sailors, but just being able to talk to them about the trends, like what are the things you're hearing on the deck plates, you know? Um, and since they have the opportunity to talk to so many different people in confidence, um, that is a way I think that you can measure the pulse of some of those issues at the command. Um, the CO suggestion box, um, which I know sounds sort of archaic, but literally people filling out pieces of paper or cards and putting them in the suggestion box, and they're free to do that anonymously. You know, you can certainly learn about specific issues, and you can also learn about trends if multiple people um, highlight issues. And then, you know, I think command climate surveys, which are done on a certain period of city after a change of command annually at a command are also good ways to identify, um, you know, things within the command um, that, you know, people might not always bring up um, sort of in a way that's attributable to an individual, but can feel comfortable bringing them up um, and, you know, that type of um, survey, but, you know, really relying, relying as well on the senior enlisted um, and what they're hearing from the deck plates too. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And to answer your question in the chat, yes, uh, we will send around a recording um, of the Zoom for folks. Uh, next, we'll go to Craig Hooper. Hi, Craig. Hey, how are you? I'm well, Thanks. how are you? I'm good. Thanks for doing this. Hey, so you said that the Navy is taking a deep and broad look. Uh, could you clarify if the Navy investigation is focusing on housing and manning during refits only, or is the Navy expanding their review to cover sort of other egregious enlisting how enlisted housing failings, like uh, the one exposed earlier this year at Walter Reed's uh, National Military Medical Center? Um, so Craig, um, and I think you probably should refer back to the Navy to get more specifics. Uh, the deep, when I say deep, I think that's deep as far as CVN 73 specifically and the incidents that we're discussing. And when I say broad, I think that the purpose of this is broadly to look at the um, environment on ships when they're in overhaul. Look at contributing factors to the delays. Look at you know the the manning and the phasing of the manning um, for the right fit and fill. So the right people with the right skills at the right time to get into the availability and then come back out of it with a trained crew. Um, about the housing issues relative to essentially it would mostly be junior sailors, single sailors who would not otherwise be eligible to receive a housing allowance to live off the ship. But, you know, kind of what is the right and appropriate means to birth them, whether that's birthing barges, more PPV, um, and, you know, specifically in the Hampton Roads area for these RCOHs. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Sam Legrone. Good afternoon, Congresswoman. Um, so when we were talking with Airland a little earlier today, he said that um, the ship was about uh, 95% fill for junior sailors, but only about 60% for the chief's mess. Um, to me, uh, especially when you have a, a situation where you have sailors and extremists uh, in terms of mental health or, or a variety of issues, that, that, that ratio seems low to me. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is, is how much is this uh, what's happening on George Washington uh, unique to that command and that ship and those circumstances, or, or how much of this is actually a larger systemic issue with Manning and the Navy? Um, you know, when you have to pull um, sailors off a cruise to go and, and, and serve the deploying stuff. I mean, I think we saw that uh, with Fitz and McCain. So you went to a 95% fit fill. Well, where were those sailors coming from? They were coming from the yards. So um, from, from, your, from your visit and from, from what you all are learning here, what, where, where are you seeing sort of those divisions of responsibility for what's going on right now? Yeah, so I, I definitely also heard something similar from some of the senior enlisted I talked to today on the ship. Um, and they didn't specifically cite undermanning in the chief's mess, but I didn't actually see a full layout of the manning data and the fit fill for the GW. But what they specifically talked about um, was sort of the, you know, second term sailors, E5s, E6s, who have um, fleet experience, who are on the ship, who are the people who are really you know, the, the folks who provide that middle level leadership at the work center level, as well as the technical expertise for something very complicated, like getting a ship out of the yard. I mean, these are sort of like once in a lifetime procedures, essentially the sailor may only do once to remove a very complex piece of equipment from layup and get it operating again. So I think, you know, your question was aimed at, you know, sort of not having that senior enlisted leadership, but having a very large contingent of junior sailors. And I would certainly say, um, that, you know, anecdotally, that could very well be a contributing factor. Um, and, you know, there was discussion today about fit and fill as well. Like they have seemingly enough people, but they don't necessarily have enough people with the right skills for the phase that they're in of the availability, um, which is essentially lighting off the ship um, and finishing the repairs. Um, so at, when I was on board today, for example, you know, the reactor and engineering departments are operating the equipment on the ship that they operate you know, and, and, and testing it. Um, but other portions of the ship, you know, are, are very frequently assigned outside of what their normal duties would be. I mean, they're not launching and recovering aircraft. So the aviation department is assigned to do other duties. And it was definitely part of their discussion of doing that analysis of the right manning at the right time um, on carriers and RCOH. Um, and they um, said that they were going to be doing a deep dive into that. Um, and then also in the particular case of GW, I think it's been complicated by the fact that they have just recently announced that they're having an extension of the um, RCOH. So I think that there were sailors flowing in to train them, to prep them, to get them ready to go for sort of a much closer horizon for the end of the avail. And, you know, other, otherwise, you know, asking about morale. I mean, like, you know, here you are in the shipyard, you're a junior sailor. The only thing you know is having been in the shipyard. And now you just found out that it's extended again. So I think that that is also a very vulnerable time. And I think that, you know, the uh, senior enlisted and, you know, seen, and, and different levels of leadership should definitely have their ear to the ground for like, how does that impact people? Because if you thought it was over, it's like your deployment. Like you thought you were in the last month of the deployment, but now it's three months longer. You thought you were done with the availability. Now it's 19 months or I can't remember the exact timing, but um, extended, um, uh, it might, the 19 months might be total, but um, extended again, like what additional stress is that? Like the captain's analogy of like, what are those things that are filling up the cup and eventually it overflows and how can you identify those friction points for people? Thank you. Um, now we are going to Zach Dahlheimer. Hey, Congresswoman, thanks for having us here. Yeah, thanks um, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do want to ask you about the, uh, the the meeting that was referenced er earlier with the Master Chief Petty Officer. Uh, he brought up that uh, there's a need for more healthcare workers in the Navy, and when asked by sailors um, specifically why chaplains over psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, he had mentioned that psychiatrists are harder to find, and there's not a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists to go around the ships um, is this something that you are looking at with the Navy in terms of the trend with 
psychiatrists and psychologists within the Navy and try to get more for uh, on these ships? It is definitely something um, that I am looking about that I ask about today. I went toward the medical department, so spoke to the senior medical officer, um, and then had an opportunity to talk to um, the folks essentially on the behavioral health care team. Um, so every carrier normally has essentially two people assigned who are medical professionals in the field of mental health care. Um, so a, a psychologist and then an enlisted sailor who's a support a person, um, or they call them a, a technician to support them. Um, then they have substance abuse counselors. Um, today, when I visited the ship, they also had additional personnel who are TAD, so temporarily assigned from Portsmouth Naval Hospital. Um, uh, a lieutenant who was a psychologist and a lieutenant JG, um, who was a licensed clinical social worker. Um, and, you know, it is definitely something to look at because, you know, is that enough? Uh, and, you know, the two I just mentioned are just there temporarily for potentially 90 or days or, or more. Um, but is that is the normal contingent on the ship enough? Um, you know, the crew today um, is at about 2,700. Um, when they man up fully for the ship's company, they'll be at about 31 to 3,500. Plus then you add the air wing um, and other embarked staff. You know, can one provider, you know, manage that number of uh people, especially when they're deployed and there are no other resources. Um, but I've also heard, you know, on the shore side at Naval Medical Center Portsmouth, um, you know, that they are in need of more staff with those skills. It's definitely something for me to, to dig into because there are a lot of changes that have been happening in BUMED, the Bureau of Medicine within the Navy and the Defense Health Agency, DHA. And then above and beyond that, like within the local geographic area, there's essentially a huge dearth of mental health care providers. And, um, you know, the, it's a lot more demand relying on a lot less available um, providers to, to treat these sailors, their families, the, the community as a whole. So, I mean, it's a, it's a large issue. And then focusing down on the ship, you know, I think we do need to look at the manning and, and understand if, you know, on the medical professional side, what is being provided to a carrier is enough. Um, for the size of the crew and their needs. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Dave Ress. Um, Hi, Dave. Hey, Congresswoman. Hey, I had a question. It's sort of an awkward one, and it may be one that it takes a little bit more time to get at, but you sort of have to ask about um, command climate you know, whether you're talking at the top or the chiefs or even, uh, you know, leading petty officers. I was wondering if in visiting today, if you got any any sense at all that that might be an issue on the, on the George Washington. Um, you know, Dave, I've um, you know, spent some time on carriers in the yards as well. And, um you know, walking around and, you know, I'll tell you that when I was walking around talking to sailors, you know, I kind of just went off on my own, talked to some sailors who were at the, you know, drink machine or some sailors who were coming out of the birthing or different things and, you know, don't feel like they were sort of being watched by the the command to hear what they were saying to me. There was really no one within earshot. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the, com the command, the sailors are going through a really tough time because of these losses, especially sailors who had a personal connection um, to those who were lost recently. I think as far as command climate is concerned, I, you know, I, I have concerns um, about some things on the ship, but I didn't see any, you know, large red flags. Um, I think that, as I said earlier, I think that the captain and the command master chief, they have their head and their heart in the right place. And they're taking advantage of all of the resources that they can muster from the Navy and really making demands of their own leadership um, to, to make some changes. And, um, you know, I think that, I would, I'm looking forward to how the Navy, you know, assesses from an outside observer of the, the ship on that issue of command climate, because I think that that will also be incorporated in um, the, the work that they're doing. But, you know, I, I understand it's a challenging environment. I talked to a couple sailors, um, you know, who are really stressed by the environment, by the loss of a shipmate. Um, but I also did not feel, I didn't walk away saying that so that I saw anything during my you know, admittedly brief time, about three hours on board, um, that indicated to me that there was a you know, significant issues with the, the command climate. 
Thank you, Dave. Um, next, we'll go to Allison Winter. Hi, Congresswoman. Thanks for doing this call with us. Um, I was wondering sort of what you see as your next uh, steps in oversight of this and if you foresee any congressional hearings or investigations or if you're already thinking about some budget requests that you think need to be made. Um, so I think um, all of the above, I think when we do our hearing with Navy leadership on, I believe it's May 11th, I think that this will certainly be a topic that's discussed and I can fully anticipate um, that both within the MILPERS subcommittee as well as potentially the readiness subcommittee, there could be ongoing discussions about you know, different things related to um, this particular uh, string of events. Um, and as far as you know, budget related, I um, I think that we need to look really closely, and I'm talking to Congressman Bobby Scott, um, he joined me on the visit as well, um, about what are the things that we can do you know, in the vicinity of the shipyard, working with the Navy, the shipyard, the city of Newport News, for example, um, to provide, you know, better living conditions nearby, more of the PPV, um, the which is a public-private venture, which is in single sailor housing, the better conditions with parking, you know, kind of all of the stressors that make sailors' lives in that environment more difficult. Um, I would certainly encourage um, including that or prioritizing those things within the Navy's budget, but they haven't made any specific requests for that. Um, in this budget. So, um, you know, I'm going to keep um, sort of pinging at that and say like, you know, kind of what what are these things that we we need to do which are in the realm of uh, the possible right now? And, you know, I, I, I do want to pause for a second because I see that I'm not sure why the timer runs out, but and I want to be able to get to everybody's question. Um, but I think it's important to say that, um, you know, there are a lot of things that happen in the shipyard, like, you know, running buses 24-7 for five years to move sailors to a remote parking lot. You know, <laughs> the cost to do that, I think they told me over the course of an availability is like $15 million for parking in each contract for an RCOH. You know, if we invested $15 million up front in building a parking garage that's one block outside the gate, you could alleviate that in the long term. So I really think we need to be sort of you know, rather than just being, we've always done it this way, look at the things like we could actually invest those resources and solve the problem for the long term. Um, so those are the kind of questions I plan to follow up with with the Navy. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Heather Mangilio. Hi, Heather Mangilio with USNI News. Um, I wanted to know if you, when you were at the ship, if anyone talked about some of the prevention methods that they are doing for suicide, um, including um, increased education on firearm storage or increased education in firearms in general? Um, the issue of firearms was not specifically mentioned during our visit, but I would refer back to the Navy because there's perhaps other measures that they're taking for training that we didn't discuss. Thank you. Uh, Chris, last question here. Okay, um, Congresswoman, I just wanted to ask a broader Navy question. Um, the 30-year ship build-out plan came out a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. and only two of the three alternatives reached 355. Is Congress going to uh, look at a uh, bringing back that number a little bit lower so that the goal can be met? The answer is absolutely yes. I don't know if you recall last year, I was very vocal about this. And I also did, you know, a series of a statement that was a series of, you know, my reflections on the 30-year shipbuilding plan when it first came out. Um, I'll also reference you to an article in SEMSEC that came out yesterday, um, which is about the, you know, future force structure in the fleet and the loss of BLS cells over time. So that might also answer more in depth. Um, but the answer is yes. I've already talked to Mike Rogers, the ranking member on the committee. We worked together last time to get $24 billion added to the defense budget and essentially really focusing on some of these, you know, Navy shipbuilding issues. I think there's concerns with the timeline for decommissioning all of the cruisers. I understand that, you know, we have 22 now. There, there is an argument that those, especially the ones that have been placed in layup, um, you know, the, the cost to bring them back is not uh, warranted yet. Um, in the article I mentioned that I wrote in SEMSEC, I do talk about the, the need to maintain the last 12 cruisers um, through what we call the Davidson window, um, that time frame that Admiral Davidson described, you know, six years, now, to, now five years, um, in, in that window to 2027 when China is very likely to try to take Taiwan by force. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, in an ideal world, we'd be building three DGGs a year. We'd keep the, you know, the last 12 cruisers, the ones in the best material condition and have the most life left. And then we keep the last 12 cruisers to 42 years. 
we'd speed up the construction of FFGs, we'd speed up the construction of construction of Virginia class submarines, and the list is is long. Um, and you know, I think that we are facing a sort of a cliff uh, where our capability is going to drop off drastically during our most vulnerable window. So, and I've had those conversations with many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. So you can expect us to see <laughs> some pushback on the Navy budget. Thank, Thank you. you Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, well, I think that worked out, Jace. Like we, we have a minute left. I'm not sure why we have a timer today on the Zoom, but um, again, if you do have additional questions that we didn't get to in today's conversation, don't hesitate to reach out, reach out to Jace. We're happy to um, talk again in more link, at more length about any of the issues from today. So, you know, really appreciate your taking an interest um, in the George Washington and the sailors there, um, and just taking time to to hear my reflections on the visit that I that I had today. And um, I'm going to continue to be in close contact with the Navy to understand the results of their internal investigations, and also from the congressional side to provide any resources that we can in a timely manner to address the issues that have been identified. So thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman, and, and thanks all. We're going to end the Zoom call now. Okay. Thank you, everybody.